I am uh, Subrata Goshroy. I have the uh, uh, difficult job of uh, chairing this panel. And I want to thank Jonathan first for uh, asking me to do this. Uh, most of you don't know me. Um, I am a, a research affiliate at uh, MIT's uh, Science, Technology, and Society program. I've been here about 10 years. But uh, my, most of my professional career, I was an engineer in defense industry working on high-powered lasers for Star Wars. And, and I finally left uh, that profession being totally disgusted. Well, you haven't heard the punchline yet. Um, <laughs> I went to uh, Congress as a science fellow. I think Alan was uh, a science fellow also in, in Congress, not at the same time. Um, and then I went to work for the Government Accountability Office, determined to bring accountability to the Pentagon. And I ended up becoming a whistleblower because we had, I had the lead job in investigating a sensor failure in the uh, missile defense system interceptor and, uh, and we found that the sensor didn't work and that data was lost and so on and so forth. And it is about Boeing. So I uh, uh, tried to convince uh, the watchdog agency of Congress to publish my report uh, detailing the problems with the sensor and they wouldn't. So I uh, blew the whistle and eventually had to lose my job and I got a refuge at MIT about 10 years ago. So I'm very happy that I'm able to do what I want to do to most. And it has something to do with missile defense and that is one of the most destabilizing factors in the nuclear conflict and we're going to talk about that later on. So we have today uh, four speakers in our panel on destabilizing factors. Three are physicists, one is a non-physicist and we start <laughs> off with physicist Lisbeth Gronland, who I know for a long time. Actually, I um, um, uh, didn't meet, but saw Lisbeth on television during the uh, Star Wars debate uh, oh, on campus debates. This is back in 1984, I think. <laughs> and, uh, and she's now, of course, very big shot. She's a senior <laughs> scientist and co-director of the Global Security Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists who does very, very good work. And Lisbeth testified many times before the Congress. So I'm very happy to have Lisbeth as our first speaker, and I will introduce the others as their turn comes. Thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for uh, coming today. It's great to see so many of you. So I'm going to talk about um, how nuclear weapons might be used. We already heard about the consequences of their use. How might this actually happen? I'm going to talk about the dangers of hair trigger alert. Both the United States and Russia keep hundreds of land-based missile, missiles, nuclear armed missiles, on alert so they can be launched in a matter of minutes. And they do this because that way they could not be destroyed by an incoming attack. The U.S. has uh, 450 missiles with a single warhead in silos. They look just like this. And uh, there are, for each 10 of these missiles, there is an underground bunker that is staffed 24-7 by two people whose job it is to launch these missiles if they are told to do so. And so the idea is, if there is a launch of a missile, the U.S. would detect it first with satellite-based infrared sensors that detect the hot plume of the missile as it is launched. And then by radars, we have radars around the world that would also detect these incoming um, missiles. And then the clock starts ticking. It takes about 30 minutes for a missile to travel between Russia and the United States or United States and Russia. Less time than that if the missile is launched from a submarine, which could be much closer. So at most you have 30 minutes and it takes several minutes for these uh, satellite-based sensors and the radars to figure out what's going on. And then uh, it takes uh, several minutes for the military to decide whether or not this is a serious enough event, if there is an alert, uh, that it merits going up to the president. And for that reason, there is a person who follows the president around carrying a black suitcase 
called the nuclear football. And this contains communication equipment and a book with uh, basically uh, targeting plans. Um, so if the uh, alert goes up to this point, the president has about 10 minutes to make a decision about whether or not to launch its uh, silo-based nuclear weapons in response to a warning of an incoming attack. 10 minutes is not a long time. So there are risks associated with this posture. One, uh, there could be because these missiles are poised to be launched, it increases the risk that the launch could be by accident. It increases the risk of an unauthorized launch. It makes it easier for people to gain control of these weapons. And perhaps most important, it creates the risk of a deliberate launch, but in response to a false warning. And this is not just a theoretical problem. There have been uh, numerous close calls in the past. I'm going to talk just about three of them. There was one uh, in 1979. The US uh, Command Center at NORAD got information that there was a large-scale incoming Soviet attack. The, um, the bomber crews got ready to take off. The Airborne Command Center uh, did take off. It's supposed to contain the pre include the president, but President Carter was not on that airplane. So had things gotten farther, uh, the president would not have been in the loop on this. Um, and fortunately, uh, several minutes down the line, US satellite sensors did not detect a Soviet attack. So they concluded they stood down. They concluded that there was something wrong. It was a false alarm. It turned out that a technician had mistakenly inserted a training tape into the computer system. So in fact, the attack they were seeing looked just like the one they were expecting, because it was the one they had trained with. In 1983, Russian satellites detected five US, actually Soviet satellites, detected five incoming missiles. And the person on charge that, uh, at, uh, in charge that day had only a few minutes to decide whether or not to send it up the chain of command. The satellites appeared to be working, and yet he felt there was something not quite right. And he decided, before he knew, he decided to tell his superior that it was a false alarm. The person uh, who made this decision, people have referred to him as the man who saved the world, Stanilov. Uh, Petrov, and there was actually a movie about this incident and about him uh, by the same name, The Man Who Saved the World. It turned out that what the satellites had seen was not a launch of US missiles, but sun glint off clouds. There was another incident in 1995 where uh, Russian radars detected the launch of a missile off the coast of Norway. And it looked like it could be <laughs> the launch of a US submarine-based nuclear missile. And again, things went up the chain of command. It got all the way up to Yeltsin, who also has a uh, nuclear uh, 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 football. And um, they decided, partly because um, there were no um, corroborating uh, information from satellites, that this was also a false alarm. It turned out that it was a rocket launched by Norway. It was a scientific rocket. And Norway had informed other countries as protocol to let other countries know when you're doing this. But it hadn't reached the right person in Russia. So they, when they saw this launch, they assumed the worst and uh, went you know, up the chain of command. So these are, um, these are just some examples. And you can imagine other things going. Uh, wrong in, in similar ways. Um, former Secretary of State of Defense, rather, uh, Bill Perry, who's with us today and will be speaking with us today. Um, <clears throat> in his recent book, uh, My Journey at the Nuclear Brink, has a very uh, apt summary of this uh, situation. These stories of false alarms have focused a searing awareness of the immense peril we face when in mere minutes our leaders must make life and death decisions affecting the whole planet. We don't want to be in this situation. 
And as bad as this is, it actually could get worse. China's military is interested in putting China's missiles on hair trigger alert. Currently, they are not. They're not on alert at all. Um, there is a concern among China's military uh, that their land-based um, missiles are vulnerable. They're mobile, but they're concerned that they're vulnerable to being tracked by the uh, United States. Uh, there is a, uh, an effort on the part of the military to make this policy change. It's not clear um, how well the high political leadership in uh, China is following what's going on. This is some recent information that we have uncovered. It's on our website. Um, and so that would, that would only be worse. The possibility of these um, false alarms would be quite high for a new warning system. China would have to build a warning system. It doesn't have one. And so uh, currently, it's only the US and Russia that have this policy of uh, being able to launch under a uh, warning. And so China might be a third such country. So our president knows that this is a problem. After he was elected, uh, before he took office, there was a, a, his, uh, his team put out a statement, Barack Obama believes that we should take our nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert. Maintaining this Cold War stance today is unnecessary and increases the risk of an accidental or unauthorized nuclear launch. When his administration did their nuclear posture review in 2010. They decided not to change this. But it's not too late. The, the odds are, I don't want to mislead you, uh, the odds are very low that he would make a decision to take our missiles off alert. He could do so without congressional approval, without Russian cooperation. The most likely time that he would do so, I think, is after the election, after the presidential election, but before he leaves office. Um, but if not this president, maybe the next one. It's something that we're going to keep, keep pushing on. And uh, with that, I will end. There is more information on this issue on our website, which is right here. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you.